teacher at I'm the menopause yoga teacher at Aruna Yoga Studio. Unfortunately, Laura can't be with us this evening. She's feeling a little bit poorly. So we just want to, I want to wish her well because it's Laura who's made this happen this evening. Um, and for this amazing panelist of speakers that we're going to have on board as well. So our common theme this evening is menopause. And although menopause directly affects half of the population, it's it, up until recently, it's remained quite a taboo subject. Now that's changed, thank goodness, over the past couple of years, thanks to our own Joe Duffy, Davina McCall, people like that, love them or hate them, they've all contributed in their own way. Um, and with menopause pause and menopause symptoms, a lot go misdiagnosed for women throughout their journey. So we're here this evening just to shed a little bit of a light in a holistic way uh, across a couple of menopause um, topics. I'm delighted to say that following on from tonight, we're going to be doing one-to-ones, um, one-to-one webinars or one-to-one -one podcasts with the individual speakers as well. So I know Laura was on this morning already with Dr. Janet um, talking about everything to do with HRT. 60 minutes is quite a short space of time. So we're only going to be dealing with a lot of the topics on surface level. So without further ado, I just want to introduce our speakers this evening. And again, all who are experts in their own field. Um, I'm going to start off with Dolores because I see her beside me on the screen. So Dolores is a general nurse, a nutritionist. She's also a holistic chef. So as we were saying earlier, she's somebody that you'd want to cook your dinner party and then sit down and have a conversation with you at the dinner party as well. And um, we also have Dawn Quinn. I'm delighted to join us. And um, Dawn is an acupuncturist and also is a traditional Chinese um, medicine practitioner. So Dawn is going to be talking to us around Chinese medicine and everything to do with that whole area, which... We could talk for hours. I was beginning to hear some of the bits she was talking about earlier on, and it's so interesting to hear the different positive approach. We also have Tanya on my other side, and Tanya is a homeopath with extensive experience supporting women throughout their, win their menopause and throughout their menopause journey. And then about uh, half eight, we're going to have Dr. Janet Brady jumping on as well. So Dr. Janet is um, a practicing GP who specializes in women's health but she's also a new mom as well. So she's just going to be jumping on for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, Laura did a, an amazing interview with Dr. Janet this morning. So over the next week or two, we're going to start sending those out as well. What I would say to you is if you have any questions along the way, please put them into the chat box and then Kate's going to be having a look at them. Hopefully we'll have 10, 15 minutes towards the end where we'll go through those questions. And if there is any questions that we don't get to cover, again, there'll be questions that we will be using during the one to one also. So we shall get started and I'd love to start off maybe with Dawn, if you don't mind Dawn, coming to you first of all. And as I mentioned, Dawn um, is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. So Dawn, maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about your, your own experience of menopause from a Chinese medicine point of view and, and maybe how menopause is understood in Chinese medicine. Great. Thanks a million, Denise, and um, it's lovely to be here. Um, so there's an awful lot that could be said, but I'm going to keep it quite short. Um, so in Chinese medicine, menopause is viewed as kind of a tradition, uh, it's kind of a tra transitionary phase. Um, and it's kind of, I suppose, the last phase in a women's reproductive cycle. So the first phase is heavenly water, which is starter periods. Um, the second phase is pregnancy and childbirth, and then we have menopause. And the kind of transition into menopause kind of starts around 42. 
So in Chinese medicine, everything works in, in kind of seven year cycles and um, seven is an important number for women. So if you think about it, when you're kind of seven years old, you start losing your baby teeth when you're 14. And um, traditionally, you would have gotten your period and from kind of 21 to 28 would be, you know, um, optimal fertility. And then you kind of start moving into different phases. But so the process does kind of start around 42. And I know that's quite a scary thing for, for some people to think about. Um, but it, it kind of does take that long. Um, and what it happens, what happens from an energetic level is the period stops. So the energy that's used in the whole kind of reproductive cycle is kind of channeled to a different place, um, which I think is kind of a nice way to think about it. So that energy is used to continue the aging process. So it's taken away from one place and, and it goes somewhere else. Um, and in Chinese medicine, you know, getting older is viewed in a very positive light um, in, in some traditional uh, cultures you know, they don't start celebrating their birthday until they're about 60. And that's a really big thing, you know. So it's just a very kind of different way to how things are viewed in, in Western, in the Western world, that menopause is something to be feared. Um, and, and people can be quite afraid around it. Um, but in Chinese medicine, it's just viewed as a, as a different kind of phase. Um, and it's, it's kind of a time where a lot of women, um, start connecting more spiritually. So they kind of find that, you know, that they want to kind of connect in with a more spiritual side. Um, so I think one thing that I really like is that there's kind of different descriptions of, of different ages. So women in their 30s are described as wolves. Women in their 40s are described as tigers and women in their 50s are described as dragons. So if you think about Love them it. positively, <laughs> they're all kind of fierce in their own way and they all have like, you know, good qualities of what, what we need to kind of get through life. And I believe, John, they refer to the, in Chinese medicine as your second spring, which I exactly. think is yeah. a lovely description and a really positive description as well. It is, yes. Yeah. So if I suppose if you think about what spring represents, it's kind of a, a new phase and it's time for growth as well. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity to kind of link in with that, um, you know, as you kind of transition, what, what, you know, what kind of growth phase it is. And as I said, you know, a lot of women do find that it's quite a spiritual time and they kind of want to connect with that a lot more. Yeah. Um, so they've kind of achieved a lot in their lives and developed. And it's, it's maybe just time for something a little bit different. Fantastic. And I know in Chinese medicine, you talk about yin a lot. Um, yes. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that, Dawn, and I suppose the role yeah. that yin plays in menopause. Yeah, so um, I suppose a, most people will be familiar with kind of yin and yang. They've kind of heard what, what they are. Um, yin is kind of, it's, it's more connection with the feminine, uh, darkness, earth. Um, you know, in a physical sense, it's very connected to fluid, um, and we, which is actually really important at this time because um, you know, what, what can tend to happen a little bit is when, as we get older, things kind of dry up a little bit and we need to kind of conserve our fluids and kind of conserve that, that yin energy. Um, but it's also very, very connected to our sense of emotional well-being. And I think this is a key thing at this time that that can really take a bit of a nosedive for some women, which is it can be really difficult, you know. So kind of conserving our yin is is kind of very important um, in the years coming up to menopause. Um, and when yin is out of balance, we can have some very distressing symptoms. So things like night sweats, uh, feelings of heat, irritability, just too hot, just too hot and bothered, you know, and that can be very distressing for, for, for women. But on the positive side, there's lots that you can do to kind of nurture that. Um, so and don't, just we might kind of, come back to that because sure, yeah. I'd, I'd love to come back to you just to talk to you about 
how Chinese medicine can help with menopausal symptoms, because I think a lot of people that are going to be on this evening, they, they want to get those key takeaways. They want to find out how it is that we can we can help ourselves going through the, this transition as well. So thank you for that. I mean, that's great to get that insight. I might bring Tanya win in here and tanya is a homeopath with extensive experience supporting women through menopause and tanya i'm sure you meet all age groups all women in all stages of their menopause and that as well maybe you can give us a feel for for your experience as a homeopath and how you've been able to support women along the way going through menopause and um, one of the main things that we'd look at is that the woman's journey, each journey is individual and the yeah. more that we can support the individual on it, the easier it is for the symptoms. But I've also found that menopause coincides with exhaustion, the time of life that women have taken on so much from so many different things. And they're at that point of going, I just can't anymore. And just everything becomes too much. So generally, one of the ways that we look at it is doing organ support. So supporting the digestive system, helping them feel better within themselves, helping with general movement and doing the things like taking the yoga class or doing the, the time out is the time that they women generally don't get for themselves. So part of what we talk about is changing the lifestyle from being about supporting everybody around you to supporting yourself and considering that you're part of things and trying where possible to ease off on, on ourselves because uh, part of our instinct and our whole nurture thing to make sure that you know children don't fall off cliffs is to have parental guilt and whether we have children or not we have that bit of watching out for other people so part of what it's to part of what we need to do is change that focus to being about us and to allowing us to not have the right uh, words for things or to have a moment that's not right or like as I'm talking to you the battery sign is coming up on my computer things just don't flow <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's that bit that allowing life to be the way it is and going with that and saying that's okay and the same way as we do when we're on the opposite side as going through puberty and the teenagers going through it and we all go off oh, isn't that terrible for them when it's a woman going through menopause, we kind of have the attitude of, well, you should know better, you should have it together. For ourselves, we feel we should have everything sorted, and um, we shouldn't. We should be. And I think that can. I think what you're saying, Tanya, you're so right. That that can be the challenge for women at this stage because, uh, as I know, it's referred to as the sandwich years. You're trying to sandwich so much into your day-to-day -day life as a woman. And years ago, it used to be at this stage that they would begin to retreat and maybe begin to take a little bit more of a step back. Now, women in their 40s, 50s, 60s have children, have careers, have older parents maybe they're looking after and that as well. So I know even in my own class, while I'm supporting women going through these changes, it can be very, very tough to take that step back and take time out for yourself and realise that it's OK to do that. And just to be aware, so one of the things I get my patients to do is to write a list of what they're doing that day, because you're so unaware that you've done the 27 other things. You just think that all you've done is just paint a room. You've forgotten that you've also done eight other billion things. So just start bringing that awareness to the person, awareness to yourself. It then can give that consideration that you would give another person. And then we'd also look at sort of physical things of doing gentle detoxes, doing walking, supporting the, the, the diet, supporting the gut health, as Dolores is going to talk about. Do you know, the things that try and strengthen the individual. Mm. And Tanya, do you, I know earlier on this morning when Laura was talking to Dr. Janet, she was talking about specifically diagnosing menopause. And Dr. Janet was talking about FS, FSH levels, doing blood tests with your GPs, how they're not always conclusive, how there is other things that need to be taken into account. How do you 
diagnose, so to speak, perimenopause or menopause with your it's, patients? Because a lot of the time it's retrospectively speaking. Kind of generally on how they're feeling. But okay. I know when, for instance, when I had the shops, I had 10 years of doing uh, a health food store. Yeah. And the, about 90% of the women that would come in with their menopause symptoms, when we did organ supports, when we got them to take time, when they actually uh, supported the liver, the kidneys, they actually didn't come back with menopause symptoms. They actually still had menopause, but they enjoyed it rather than having the pressure of it. It's it's like when you're looking the wrong way and you're sort of clashing against a brick wall because you need to get over the hot flush and you need to get on to the next thing rather than taking the moment that that's he's telling you, hold on, going too far here, just calm it down a bit. And that it needs to calm down long before that because we keep pushing ourselves too much to do too much. Sure. Um, so gentleness to the woman to you know that when we talk to them about being gentle to themselves being aware of themselves the food they do doing for themselves then an awful lot of symptoms were dissipating and do you think tanya that there is any one particular area that exasperates those symptoms more be it stress be it diet be it nutrition or is it is it a mixture of everything it's a mix which area so which string do you pull so yeah. for some people they find that if they work on diet then they feel so much better and they're able to do it for other people the thought of diet is so strong that we have to go for movement for other people movement is too difficult so we have to go for time out or we have to go for sleep so it's again about seeing there's like hundreds of different remedies hundreds of different ways of doing it and when you're talking to somebody one of them will appeal to them they'll sort of get the flicker and go okay yeah i can do that and that shouldn't be a mountain to climb it should all be gentle easy steps and every time we do one more gentle easy step it eases the pressure it takes the pressure off the person and they're able to see more and do more and that one step can have that ripple effect. Can have that ripple effect you only yeah. need to change one thing and then it can have that yes. ripple effect onto everything yes. else. Thank you. Um, Dolores, I might come to you next because I know your transition into menopause was quite sudden and wasn't a gradual transition and was a little bit different to what a lot of people go through and, and talking to you earlier on it, it just was quite a shock as well can you give us a, a bit of an overview and again with, with all our panelists we're going to be going into the the the, the individual areas more on a one-to-one -one basis um with our our individual interviews but maybe you could give us a bit of an overview of your own transition yeah um thank you don uh 2009 in the month of april i went for my check mammogram end of march april check mammogram and they found a tiny thing on my breast and so i went and had an operation for that a month later and then in order to give me the hormonal the, the therapy the chemo hormonal therapy i got my a scan of my uterus and they found a tiny little tumor in my uterus so uh, it was four months later, and 3rd of September, I had a radical hysterectomy. They took out my ovaries, my womb, everything. It was, uh, and so I went like into overnight menopause. Um, and so then, you know, had a bit of time off work and went back to work. Didn't really think about this whole thing of time and giving myself space. I, I didn't have the space in myself to allow myself even to think about it. So uh, yeah, it was it was quite a, quite a shock shock menopause we'd call it, and it took me quite a while to get over the cancer more than the menopause. I shouldn't say more than the menopause, but the the fear of I, I I didn't buy any new shoes for two years. I just was in which made all my symptoms worse. I'm sorry the reference to shoes, but it's like I think you can understand. It was like I don't I'm not going to wear my winter boots, so why get them? Um, and Dolores, were you supported along the way with this happening, or was it very much you were thrown into the darkness all of a sudden throw i mean absolutely i mean thrown into the darkness all of a sudden and i mean i live with my husband is you know fantastic i've got great support around me great friends and everything and at the same time um uh i looking back now i think um it would have been smart for me to do some sort of counseling or to be guided into some sort of counseling or therapy of some sort uh, it, now looking back, I can see it more clearly. Whereas at the time, I was just 
keep moving, keep moving. And I have to get back to work. I have to get back to work. I have to earn money. I have to, you know, the, the rat on the wheel or the hamster yeah. or gerbil or whatever. And continued on that way for years and exhausted myself. I mean, listening to the conversations about preparing for menopause, I had no idea. I was 41, 42, uh, still contemplating having kids. It was just a, a complete shock. Uh, and then, you know, some, the, the side effects for me, I mean, I, but I don't know if it was exactly menopause, I would drove myself crazy. So I kind of interrupted my sleep a lot and then exhaustion became more bigger. I, I you know, I dug a hole deeper for myself as it went along. And what did you turn to, Dolores? Because you come from a nursing background yourself, yes, do you? I do. Yes, I yeah. do. So you, you must have had that, or maybe you didn't, but it, just because of your own training, did you have any awareness as to what was going on with your body and what you could do to, to support it or help Absolutely. it yourself? Absolutely. Um, I think I had way more information than I could be bothered to follow because I was just in my own misery, shall we say. So it wasn't a great space for me psychologically. And looking back, I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. You know, it changed me on a fundamental level that I became I, I want to say a bigger person and it's not up to me to say that I'm a bigger person you know that's kind of egotistical I grew so much it, I used it as a, a springboard to do all these other things and become a holistic chef and do you know just change actually is part of it as well it's like rather than going this way this way this way this way I have to do this way it's like oh because I can't I couldn't do this anymore yeah. because I wasn't sleeping so I, was, I still had to get up and go to work and there was all the walls of my perceived reality were disintegrating around me I mean I make it sound so dramatic don't I anyway I, it was a difficult time and like everybody's menopause is different and if, so for some people they don't even know that it's going on it's we're all so individual and my how did, way, you, how did my, you get through with Dolores well I'd already I mean I, I just am a, I'm an addict for acupuncture and I've been doing acupuncture all my life and so uh, I began to expand my addictions um, and I moved into doing Pilates and you know I would at the time I even did yoga um, so I kind of it, it, my symptoms forced me to grow because I didn't I didn't come from, oh, I need to do this, which would have been smart. It was the, the other way around. I had, you know, inflammation in my joints. So I began to read up about why my joints were inflamed, why I had so much heavy physicalness um, and not so much putting on weight, but feeling swollen. And so that led me into, you know, nutrition research and reading about and learning about food and how I react to food and how uh, bread, I mean, I have a thing about white bread. I love it. And, uh, and I live in France, so I'm allowed to love it. And I've, it's like, it's such, uh, it's, you're better off eating the cardboard of your cornflakes packet <laughs> than the white bread. It's like, there's no nutrition in it. And so it's like, there's a, for um, what I feel now is that it's okay to eat bread. It's not like gluten, no gluten, there's so many rules. And we all set up so many rules for ourselves by reading. I mean, the internet, it's all there. The information yeah. is all there for everybody. And I went down that rabbit hole and it's not an idea and not a good idea in my opinion. So my first piece of wisdom for you ladies is don't panic. It'll be okay. Yeah. You get through this. It's okay. And there's a lot of information out there, but I think it's, it's, it's trying to get the factual information as a correct. To, yeah. Talk to a friend, especially, you know, like call me I don't mind yeah it's like we, we can do we're we're women and I for me it's like we're in it together it's like we're in life together we're holding each other up I mean all my therapists my you know I've, 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 my acupuncturists all women and all my doctors all women because I feel we we know each other's support more or feelings more Mm. And Dolores, tell me this, in terms of the various menopause symptoms that you had, and now knowing what you know, did cutting out white bread help any of them? Or was there any? I'm saying I tell you, really? yes, absolutely. Well, oh, it's, okay. Oh, why? I tell you, I so noticed it was like, I don't know about weight, because I don't weigh myself, but I was like a shrunk. It's like, so if I'm going to a wedding and I want to get into that dress, I will not eat any white bread for maybe two weeks and it's good. Uh, brown bread is different. There's nutrition in it. Sourdoughs. There's, there's, there's something in the bread that is feeding your gut bacteria. One of, another one of my pet topics. Um, and so that if I feed my stomach, 
then that feeds my brain, which makes me feel better. And it's like it's a whole cycle. I know I am what I eat. I mean, that's all I can be because, you know, there's the air I breathe and then what I eat and then the thoughts I put into my mind. That's all I am. And are you at the other side of it now, Dolores, in terms of your menopause symptoms? Have you found that they've changed over the, the course of the time because of your nutrition or your your different? Oh, I'm no angel. Do don't make I don't I, I eat bread. <laughs> I eat white bread and butter. Um, uh, it's more about knowing why. OK, well, I feel that now. And it's kind of understanding myself. So um, for me, it's been a, a growth been like a, a high hill of, of learning and still is so it, yes it has changed my body has changed my body's continually changing mm. and um I don't always celebrate it and that's it you know it's like uh we you know we just keep moving and forward and doing the best we can that's the, that's my my story with me uh, and yeah, I think I mean, for you the fact that it was forced on you very suddenly it, it makes the, it makes it an awful lot more difficult than I suppose somebody who has the luxury of preparing for menopause a little bit more. And, and I don't trying. know. I don't okay. know. I don't know if it's worse for me or better for me. Yeah. I I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't have chosen to do it that way. I was thinking of having kids, you know, I was just, just beginning yeah. to get right in my head to think of it. So uh, I have no idea. I think that it's always easier on the other side of the, the field. You know, the grass is always greener. And that's just the way that it is. Somebody else might think, oh, my God, she's so lucky. It was all over overnight. And when I see women with periods, I think I'm so lucky. Oh, I haven't had that for a year. <laughs> oh, I, I celebrate. So it's smart to want what is. And I, I don't it, it's great thing to say. And I don't always follow it myself. So it's not like I'm some angel. Yeah. Dawn, I know that you mentioned earlier on that that you have you supported women along the way who've had crisis menopause or or similar um, stories to Neve. Um, how, how have you found that in terms of uh, Chinese medicine medicine for supporting around that area? Yeah, so, um, you know, it it. Put, I have in the past, and it could be people who have been kind of, I suppose, put into menopause through cancer treatments, um, you know, like Dolores, or it, you know, as, as, as Tanya mentioned earlier on, could be a shock thing, you know, and I, I suppose it's, it's, um, it's an incredibly difficult time because there isn't the run in, you know, so it's just, it's just kind of like that. And it can be, it can be really difficult because, they can be dealing with the trauma of, you know, having a cancer diagnosis, which is, is, is hugely impactful, as well as all of these very, very difficult physical symptoms. Um, so, you know, the, I, I think the, the most important thing is that they really seek out support at the time. And, um, you know, a lot of the time, particularly with cancer, when, when people come out the other end of it, that's when they really, really need the support because all of the appointments, all of the kind of medical stuff is kind of finished and that kind of, I suppose, structure around that. And then it's kind of like the, the emotional impact really kind of happens. So, you know, it's it's just to really say to people to, you know, to really seek out support. Um, and how Chinese medicine can help is it, it, it's a very holistic, um, you know, modality. So it helps support the emotional and physical. Um, and then, we, you know, we can make suggestions to people around like, you know, things to incorporate in their diet. Um, I think one of the, the really key things that I'd like to say to people is to um, really think about kind of yin nourishing activities that can help support you and that is that can be really different for lots of different people so you know thing things for one person might be you know you mentioned meditation to some clients and they're like oh no and they just can't do it you know or they they're on the table and the thoughts of actually spending 30 minutes lying there terrifies them you know so you really have to work with the person and what works for them so you know things like listening to music whether it's reading painting gardening baking you know tai chi qigong meditation it's loads of things but the important thing is what works for you 
um, oh, because what yeah. works for one person doesn't necessarily Absolutely. work for the next person. And like we've all said, everybody's journey is individual. And that's why it can be so difficult to, to offer advice because what works for you may not work for me. And just on that note, I'd like to introduce Dr. Janet Brady. Um, Dr. Janet, thanks a million for popping on and congratulations. I know you have a new bundle of joy there that you've been trying to look after along the way as well. So thank, thank you. Thanks for joining us this, e this evening and happy International uh, Menopause Day to you. Thank you. <laughs> so I know Laura had a great chat with you this morning on a one-to-one -one where you dived into the HRT side. Um, and I, I got the, had the luxury of watching it earlier. And I think it's going to be so beneficial for everybody in terms of um, giving the information that's required. But just while we have you there, I just want to see, Kate, is there anybody specifically who has asked questions around the HRT side? I know one of my ladies in my yoga class, um, Dr. Janet, she asked me to ask just around HRT. Um, how do you do, how do you, and it's a very general question, but how do you decide whether or not to go on HRT? And where can you go to get the proper advice around it? Okay, so um, thanks very much. Very daunting to be on a on a, a webinar or a Zoom call with so many people. Um, with all the usually everyone has their camera off, so it's great to see faces. Um, yeah, so it's a really broad question. I suppose it depends on the woman, and I know I went into it in the video, but it's you know it's an individual basis, and usually you know, women come to me with a constellation of symptoms. Um, and I was saying it is it is a clinical diagnosis. Usually it's in the history. So I did, I put up, you know, there's the green climacteric index, which you can Google, um, but there's loads of symptoms. It's not just hot flushes, as we all know, it's brain fog, joints, aches and pains, palpitations, you know, it has a huge impact um, on women's quality of life. So if you are getting a lot of those, some women just opt, you know, they don't want hormones, which is fine. Um, some will have come after trying non-hormonal um, options and maybe they have spent some benefit, but not an optimal benefit that they're able to, you know, function in their day-to-day -day life. So really by the time they're kind of with me, um, a lot of women have decided, you know, I want to go with the HRT route. Um, so, I mean, if it's, if it's really impacting you and you're, you've tried things and, you know, it, it's not working, then, you know, it's so, it is really safe. Um, it's really well studied. There's a wealth of information about it out there. Um, and it is kind of going to the right person because I was explaining in the webinar or in the, the interview earlier, GPs are all trained in menopause care, but there, there is a wealth of inf information out there and there's varying degrees to which different doctors are trained. So some GPs do extra training specifically in menopause care, which I have done. Um, so it depends. You can inquire yeah. at your local general practice. You know, they, some of them do menopause or well woman checks and they will advertise it in their in the bio. So if you look up the doctors, they will say they either have, you know, an extra diploma in women's health or they, they you know, this, they specialize in uh, menopause care, then they're the right person to go to. Yeah, um, you know, I know uh, you mentioned that this morning, just getting that specialist care is key yeah. because it, it's a lot more than a 10 minute conversation of yeah. ticking boxes. You have to go through people's history. Yeah. You have to yeah. go through tests and that as well. One yeah. of the questions that's just being posed is for somebody who's on HRT a year now and feels it's not working. Okay. What, what would you advise that she does next? Do you know what she's taking or did she specify? She hasn't specified what she's taking, but maybe because I know she's on, maybe if she wouldn't mind popping it in there, what it is, Ellen, that you're taking at the moment. Um, yeah, because it depends. Um, is it that yeah. you need to change it and adjust it quite yeah. a lot over the space of time until you yeah. find that it's working, Dr. Jack? Yeah. yeah, like rarely, yeah. I mean, very, very, you know, occasionally I strike a, a, an absolute 
gold mine where you know the woman comes the first time and I prescribe my I have certain go-to um HRT preparations I prefer and you know they come back six weeks later and 100% better but often it does require a bit of titration and sometimes changing I'm just reading here all three program test estrogen high dose progesterone that is okay so yeah, I was going to say, so that, so I would start sometimes on the transdermal route for estrogen, which is um, either a patch or a gel, because it has kind of the, low, the, the, the best safety profile. There's no increased risk of blood clotting on it, and it's, um, it's very easy to titrate up and down. I kind of titrate up the, the dose in that. If that's not working, then maybe change the route. So go for oral estrogen, like a tablet, um, and then sometimes changing the progesterone, which is what we combine with the estrogen. Um, so progesterone is important for protecting the lining of your womb, sometimes changing either the, the route of administration. And sometimes um, it's either a tablet or sometimes vaginally um, or even changing to an intrauterine device can sometimes help. And I think um, what we might do is because yeah. I know I know this could go on and on yeah. for you in terms of obviously, you know, it's it's nobody's going to do a diagnosis over the air yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, as yeah, well. yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, I think, you know, like you've said, it, it can take that time in terms yeah. of adjustment and change and that as yeah. well. And, yeah. and so I just see, sorry, she's on the patch. So patches, um, there's a few different, I suppose, trade names there's the most common ones are estradot or everell they kind of start around the lowest is 25 micrograms usually that doesn't do very much usually 50 micrograms starting and then goes as high as 100 micrograms so if you're if it's not you know working on that then you she might need uh, oral hrt so femitab is one milligram which is a higher dose so she might just need to maybe go back and and change the you know because the, the patch there are higher doses but the patch only goes so high so maybe she just needs to go back um maybe and have a chat with her doctor about maybe changing the the estrogen route okay thank you so much and is there an average time that people are on hrt that it's recommended for people to be on hrt um so it depends um i have some women um that are on it 10, 15 years. I have some women that are on it, you know, a couple of years. Um, I suppose five years, four to five years is kind of the time where I usually review it. I review obviously yearly when once they're stable, but at five years, um, I do kind of have a chat with the woman and see how their symptoms are, you know, if they're if they're managing well with it. And again, um, because there's new evidence coming out all the time, say women that were started initially on a tablet. I might look at those women and see could we change them to a lower dose like a, a patch or something that's a, you know a little bit lower dose and see could that manage their symptoms and um, i know i did talk about the risk of i suppose breast cancer and hrt mm -hmm. it's really topical and um, mm -hmm. there was a, a massive study that came out um but you know about breast cancer risk but really looking at the risk and um, i know i went into it in loads of detail mm -hmm. but under the age of 50, there's no proven increased risk of breast cancer with HRT versus the you know, general background population. Um, after four to five years on HRT, there's a slight increased risk of about seven to eight extra cases per 10,000 women. So it's not a massive increase. You know, when you look at, like I, I did put up the, the Women's Health Concern um, infographic of showing other modifiable risk factors or other risk factors for breast cancer like alcohol, obesity and they have um, much higher you know I think it was 24 extra cases per thousand women of breast cancer in women who are obese um, I think it was an extra four cases or four to four to seven with with alcohol drinking more than you know three to four units a day so you know when you look at the risk the, the extra cases with HRT versus those other they're not you know it's 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 a very small risk versus the benefits and if women are having you know um disabling symptoms of menopause you know and um, well we'll make sure that goes out to everybody because I know you have gone through everything in a, in a lot of depth with with the chat with Laura this morning so thank you so much for that and thank you for your time and what yeah, no can you take away Dr Jan that you would have for women be it going into the menopause or going coming out of the menopause in in how they can support themselves 
Well, I'm very aware that I'm not in menopause yet, um, so I don't want to step on any toes. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is coming. It's coming to to all women. Um, but I just from from my patients are are my best informers or informants. So I suppose going into the menopause, um, the you know being fit, uh, being active, um, you know looking after the other the opportunistic stuff with women's health that comes along with menopause like your bone health you know not smoking keeping alcohol to a minimum or, or nothing and um, doing weight bearing exercise minding your mental health what you guys are doing yoga meditation I'm really pro um all the all of that as well um and then you know not sitting at home suffering sweating it out um because there are options and it's not you know there's a lot of scaremongering about hrt and in the morning if i had you know the worst symptoms in the world i would take it um 100 so if that's thanks. any testimony <laughs> <laughs> that's great to hear and, and thanks for that tanya just on your side because i'm just conscious of time and we've only about 10 15 minutes left for women who are managing their menopause symptoms, what would be your key takeaways for something to do with the likes of sleep? Because sleep is something that comes up quite a lot. Um, I know through conversations of women in menopause or perimenopause, the lack of sleep and then the impact that it has on day-to-day -day lives. As, as a homeopath, um, <laughs> One of the areas we would look at is that people often feel that they should be doing more. They they should and they ought. So they should be uh, the proper weight. They shouldn't smoke. They shouldn't drink. They should be all these different things. But we're people, so we're not. We do things. We are overweight. We do eat wrong. We do sit around. We don't do all the things that we feel we should do. So it's to take it in small bites so that it's not, we're not trying to get suddenly to somewhere that isn't necessarily workable. So to start with the bits work for themselves. So, so even when we're not sleeping, okay, so we're not sleeping, so read a book, uh, put on the iPad, something that stops makes it that you're sitting there going, I need to sleep, I need to sleep, I need to sleep. You know, so to reduce the pressure, to take that time that if you can relax rather than sleep, sleep will actually come and we actually get more sleep than we think we do. But when we are thinking we're not sleeping, we're adding to the anxiety and we're we're adding to it the whole time. So each thing would be about trying to, to kind of go, okay, so this is where I'm at. So now what can I do to support from where I'm at rather than the, the overall goal that we think we should be? Um, and I think a lot of it does come back to, like you're saying, it's it's keeping those stress symptoms down and reducing those stress levels because it just impacts on everything else. And but being aware of yeah. small bits, not the big bits, because yeah. that can be too much for somebody. So while you are not sleeping, or sleeping, while you've got brain fog, while you can't, you feel like you're losing control in every way. Like you, you even lose a lot of your hair. You know, every bit of you changes, and you feel totally lost within it. Mm -hmm. And then you feel that this is where you should do, and one thing is going sort of, one thing is going to change it. It's not. It's a combination. You know, you you like you have your acupuncture, you have your homeopathy, you do your yoga, you go on HRT, you take the herbs alongside, like that you do mixtures of several things. In the same way as we don't all live on an apple sandwich diet, we also have our meat, we also have our veg, we also have our potatoes. You know, we have a combination of things. Same thing in life. We need a combination of things and we need to take it from the place that we're at mm. rather than further down of where we think we should be. Fantastic. Just to run through a couple of questions that are there. Um, there's a question there. I'm going to put it out there um, from Kate, who's currently 44, has no signs whatsoever that she's aware of regarding menopause. I've not had children and I was wondering, does menopause affect women who haven't reproduced differently? So just to put that out there, Dr. Janet, it might be that do you want to come in on that one? So currently 44, no signs, uh, whatever that I'm aware of. I've not had children, was wondering, does menopause affect women who haven't reproduced? 
Oh, you're thing. really you're really testing me now. So, um, <laughs> get um, blame Kate. <laughs> the best the best indicator of I suppose the age you go through menopause is looking at family history. So that's kind of when I when when someone's in a consultation, that's kind of the first thing I go by. And um, so often, you know, if women have a late menopause, um, you know, their their mother or their grandmother might have gone through late menopause. Um, not having kids off the top of my head um i'm not i don't i'm not aware um but i do know with with um certain i suppose no not not off the top of my head um but i mean she's 44 so she might not be getting any symptoms anyway do you know what i mean like she's not the average age of, of completion of menopause is 12 months without a period so yeah. the average age of menopause is around 51 52 so not every woman gets menopausal symptoms in the seven to ten years leading up to it um so she could she be might, one of those lucky she women. might be just lucky yeah, yeah yeah she might just get not get be getting any symptoms yeah um, and I would see and, it from patients that it would be there would be a difference in my patients they have noticed that quite often they have a quicker they, they, they get it's different there has the not having children they do talk about it being different though in the way that they have had symptoms so yes, <laughs> okay. Okay, it's great to see the different opinions depending on the areas of focus. Just from Mary there, um, Mary, you mentioned about talking to a friend how important it is. And one thing that we want to do, and and Laura has been the leader in this, um, with Aruna, is create that sense of community for people, so women know that they're not alone and that they are supported, and to reach out. If, if it is that you need help to reach out and there's so many different areas of expertise even within Kildare I know when I started my journey I thought I had to go to Dublin and a lot of the time years ago initially people did have to go to Dublin but now it's fantastic to see that that support is throughout the country um, and Stephen Donnelly even bringing it into the curriculum now the whole menopause awareness side is going to be amazing so I know we're all going in the direct right direction Mary said nothing prepared me for the start of the menopause it was like a silent person who arrived in the middle of the night however the yoga mat kept me sane and happy Mary, I'm delighted to, I might be biased, but I'm delighted to hear, to hear it on that side. Dawn, have you any tips um, as we come to a close? Have you any tips for women with menopausal symptoms or approaching menopause from the Chinese medicine side? Sure, Denise. So I, I suppose kind of, I maybe have top three things. And the first one is, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine, a lot of the hot flashes can be, you know, and night sweats can be to do with how, what we're eating and how we're eating. So trick is eat until you're 80% full and leave it at that because then you're kind of giving your digestive system a bit of a break to, to, to kind of do the job that it needs to do. And um, the second one is something I touched on for whatever kind of deeply nourishing activities work for you to give you that kind of sense of peace serenity that all will be well and um, just and don't don't matter what anyone else says don't listen to them do what works for you um and really think about maybe a mind balancing um mind body balancing activity like yoga tai chi qigong they can work on a really deep level and just kind of really help balance out those really kind of you know irritability and and just you know every woman knows those feelings that come with hormones so you know it's it's just to really kind of help smooth that out so those will be my top three fantastic and I know Dawn we had interrupted you you had been talking about the options for keeping your yin side well um just yeah. earlier would you mind just finishing on that just I know sure asking yeah no problem so um, I suppose in terms of diet, um, things like kind of fish, sea vegetables, you know, your seaweeds, um, seeds, uh, kind of, you know, uh, nuts, dairy, eggs. For the veggies and vegans, soy and tofu, 
I suppose the only caveat to have around soy is to really make sure where it's coming from, you know, it's not genetically modified, really good quality um, and beans. So, and balance is key, not overdoing it. In, in, in the West, we tend to just throw the kitchen sink at something. So it's kind of more around just, you know, just kind of doing what you can, but not overdoing it on, on certain things. Um, we have the rest... famine gene, Dawn. We're going to find it <laughs> hard to do that 80% of exactly. and not cleaning the plate. Well, well, that's it. And, you know, when, when I was training in Vietnam, the Vietnamese absolutely love fat. They absolutely love it. And it comes in everything. And it is to do with their kind of, or, you know, when food was scarce, they they ate a lot of fat. So those kind of cultural things, we you know, we, we're, they're just genetically imprinted. <laughs> um, so, they, you know, rest, really just some kind of deep nourishing rest. Um, try to just find some time away from work responsibilities. I know it's difficult because women around this time, there's a lot of, um, you know, they have to mind kids, they may have aging parents, they may be at the pinnacle of their, their career. So th there's kind of a lot going on, but really just if, if you can do that. Um, and as, as I kind of touched on before, just the, the yin activities, you know, wh whatever it is that works for you, women kind of tend to find, you know, around this time that they just want to engage in something creative and mm -hmm. tapping into that can really give a, a good sense of well-being. So whatever it is, do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dolores, just over to you for your final words of wisdom. And we could all talk, we could keep going for another two or three hours quite e easily. I mean, we're only beginning to get into it now at this stage. <laughs> Um, I, it's lovely, it, wonderful. Thank you, Denise. Listening to everybody and putting me in the in their in their narrative, you know, when they were talking about, it's like, okay, okay, I can see that. So I think that there's something very profound about getting a perspective and sharing and hearing other people's opinions, point of view, because I mean, uh, everything that Denise and Tanya have been saying certainly rings true for me. On it, I just I use different words for the same information and come at it from a slightly different point of view. It's the same thing, which is be gentle with myself, um, enroll help, talk to my husband about it. I mean, my poor husband thought he was living with a sunbed for however long, you know, it's like in the middle of the night and then back and then I was freezing anyway. So it's uh, enroll help, talk to the husband, talk, talk about it. I mean, I, I can't express enough how blessed I am that I have places where I can talk. Um, yeah, and the other wisdom thing for me about my experience is don't panic. I did, and it didn't change a single thing, um, you know, and don't go reading too much on the internet because it didn't change anything for me. What well, I don't, I'm just, it didn't work for me and I, I really can see how stupid I was doing it. Do it stupidly, I was doing it. I just went down a rabbit hole and it's really smart to work on inflammation and whatever way you choose. I think like if you choose diet as in, you know, there's loads of things we can talk about in with foods that are alkaline and then coming from a different place, you know, would be the, you know, there's homeopathic remedies and acupuncture is very good with helping with the um, keeping my body alkaline and keeping inflammation down because that causes or I don't want to say causes anyway, greatly influ influences my joint mm -hmm. pain, my brain fog, my feeling of wellness in my spirit shall we say because my tummy feeds my brain thank you thank you so much and tanya you finally your your final word or two there's an awful lot of help and support out there and you don't have to do it one way so if you're on hrt you still can use homeopathy if you're doing homeopathy you can still do acupuncture just not any one direction and everybody's individual so if one thing doesn't work we just find something else that does and one thing sometimes partially works and then you need something else to support it and that's okay too it's a joyous time of life it's really connecting women to themselves and their bodies are finally going do you know what i can't do it anymore you need to actually listen to me so if we can listen to our bodies we can come out of it so much and so much more like having the gift of menopause and it really the patients I've worked with have come out so joyous for the gift of it it's it 
may be difficult right now, but it does get easier. It does get better and it can be wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And it's lovely to finish on that positive note. Guys, thank you for joining us this evening. And the reason we were all here as well was to raise some funds for um, breast cancer awareness and the Women's Shed, which I know we've done. So really appreciate your support with that. We hope that this is going to be the first of lots of interesting conversations. It's up to every one of us to keep that conversation going and help educate and inform women who are out there as well. Thank you so much to your, the panellists for giving your time up this evening um, and for sharing all the amazing and wonderful information that you've had. And if that has helped one person tonight, we're doing our job right. So just to wish you all a lovely evening and wish you a wonderful International Menopause Day. And thanks again to Laura for organising this. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Good night, ladies. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.